Welcome everyone um, to, our, to today's webinar and uh, it's entitled um, In Conversation with the Honourable Matthew Guy. So I'm John Stecklenberg and I'm the um, Chair of the Chamber. Um, and before we commence today, I'd just like to acknowledge the Wadawurrung traditional owners of the land upon which we stand today, the respective areas on which you all gather and all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are part of the Greater Geelong community. I pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd like to just say a, a special big uh, thank you to our platinum partner, Pixel, and all our corporate partners. And I also welcome all our chamber members and people from the broader business community joining us today. But on to our special guest. So our, our special guest today is the Honourable Matthew Guy, the member for Bulleen, leader of the Victorian Liberal Party and leader of the opposition. So thank you. Matthew, for giving of your time this afternoon. And for those in the audience today, um, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat function and we'll try and get um, put some of them to, to Matthew. So Matthew, um, it's not going to be a hard hitting political interview, so we're going to let you off the hook today. But I think our audience in Geelong would, you know, be really interested to, to know a bit about you and meet you as a as as the person, Matthew Guy and, and our potential. Um, next Premier. So Matthew, you're the um, member for Bulleen, which is uh, in the Heidelberg area. And how did you think your community um, got through the whole COVID crisis? John, thanks very much for having me. And I appreciate this is, uh, we've tried it a couple of times in the Chamber, so I really appreciate your patience um, with my ability to get a Zoom to work correctly. And think after two years now of doing this, we all would. Um, and thanks to um, Bev MacArthur, my colleague who's on here as well, and everyone from the Chamber of Commerce has made the time at, uh, at lunchtime to come and be a part of our chat. Um, yep, my scene is, seat is Bulleen. So it's four suburbs, the entirety of just four suburbs, which is Bulleen, Lower Templestow, Templestow and Doncaster. So we're kind of halfway between the Box Hill Hospital, which is just to the south, and the Austin, which is um, obviously just to the west. Um, my community, my my. Uh, seat is the oldest in metropolitan Melbourne. So um, it's also blessed because we've, we've got the Yarra River to the north and quite a lot of parklands, linear parklands, which run north-south through the whole city of Manningham area. So how did people get through COVID? Well, there's the two halves of my community that I represent. One half is quite old and one half has kids. There's not much in between those. So you'd see the people with kids like mine out trying to run them during the day because with boys, you know, you, you can't leave them inside too long or it becomes a nightmare. But then there's the older parts of our community. And I, I had done a number of direct mails. People think everything nowadays has to be online. No, it doesn't. My community still, where my seat, I should say, still heavily depends on contact via what is impolitely called snail mail into the letterbox. And we dismiss that, but it is still a very important communications device for older people who don't, don't want to get an iPhone like my parents. And uh, while well, they were tech savvy, that's not their primary source of information. So we kept saying on a number of mail outs to my constituency, knock on your neighbour's doors, check up on your residents, you know, make sure you are in contact with a lot of people because there were a lot of older people I know in isolation, widows, for instance, who were going weeks without being able to actually see anyone. And that level of so social isolation didn't just affect, you know, younger people in apartment blocks in South Bank, which did have a major effect, but it also affected a lot of older suburbs. And I imagine in parts of Greater Geelong, that's the case too, where you had people living by themselves who, and in Doncaster, a lot of those are of a non-English speaking background, who didn't have contact with people for weeks, maybe by the phone, but they didn't see their children, they didn't see their grandchildren, they didn't see their neighbours. And so how do they get through it? With a lot of social isolation by a large portion of that community. And so now it's all about re-engaging people. And that's very, very important. And Matthew, what about yourself? You know, you've got three three kids and, and your wife. How did, how did you get on? And I, I presume the three kids are at school. Yep. Killing each other at home. Parents Thank about you. to kill them yes, and vice versa. Yes, they are. yes, How yes, yes. Well, you've picked my household very well. It's all very accurate. Um, you know, my eldest did grade six in 2020 and started year seven in 2021. 
So that's his experience of grade six. That's his experience of 2021. My son who's in grade five this year missed out on school camp. Um, my little one missed out on his first grade one camp and excursions and all that. They miss out on all these things. So how do they deal with it? Well, when you're told, well, my, my, my grade five son, for instance, they had their bags packed. They were going away for camp the next day. You can imagine the excitement of a kid and then to be to get an email late at night saying the school is closed as a COVID outbreak camps off. Um, that's their schooling. They don't get that time back. So, you know, it was difficult. My wife works for a university, so she is she has to work during the day. Now, I'm lucky because my job as a politician, a lot of it you can do after I can choose a lot of the hours, not always, but you can choose to do things at night. It means you're busy at night or early in the morning when the kids aren't up or whatever, but I can juggle things around. A lot of families don't have that luxury. You know, and more the point, I still got paid. So did my wife. My neighbours who are small business people running a cafe in Templestowe, they didn't. And they, they're still waiting for payments from lockdown five or whatever it was. They haven't got them. So, you know, it was, it was challenging, but I still think we were better off than most. So we, we don't complain about it because we we had options a lot of people did not and i think it's fair to say that you know geelong we uh we copped it sweet but we didn't cop it anywhere near as badly as as melbourne did and whether that was good luck or good management you know um my former hospital bar and health seemed to manage um, contact tracing really well and got on top of things quite early and um mm. you know you know when the medical system at the time was very risk averse we were able to uh, shut things down but so we'll just we'll get on to a, 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 a few topics so um you know as you've just mentioned businesses have been tremendously hard hit o over the pandemic you know and, and obviously different groups have been hit harder than others and some have flourished um my own being in the medical world we we flourish but you know how, how important are businesses especially small businesses going forward to the economic recovery of victoria we can't just go forward with an attitude that the state government can borrow its way or any government, state or federal or any state, can just borrow their way out of um, an economic downturn. You know, I, I see this kind of attitude at the moment, which is, you know, we're going to build the North East Link, we're going to build these level crossings, we're going to build the Metro Tunnel, we're going to build Metro 2, we're going to build the Western Distributor, we're going to build the Suburban Rail Link. You know, we're running out of people who can actually build these things. We actually don't have the physical manpower to build a lot of this stuff that's being promised. We should actually, we've also got to build apparently 35 to 50,000 homes every year for new people wanting to live. That we're going to have an inflationary impact on our own state that is self generated, that will hurt a lot more people than the case at the moment. Small business has to be the way back. Business in general has to be the way back. That's a sensible way. Don't put more taxes on, provide incentives like New South Wales is doing. You know, the time when we need to be encouraging business growth is now. We need people to get back on their feet. That's not all about cash. It's not just saying, here's a checkbook, we'll write you cash. People just want the certainty to open. The lack of, um, particularly in Melbourne, council councils getting involved in their business to operate and the knowledge that they can just get on with these other tax parameters I work amongst not that next year you're going to get 2%, the year after we're going to add this on and we're going to add this on. We can't keep doing that. We can't keep doing that. We've got to encourage business to get on with their lives and those families to be able to prosper again because at the moment they're not. And that's the way out. The long-term way out is by getting small and medium-sized businesses back on their feet. Some are because they've done well in COVID. Most haven't, and that's not a good outcome. And Matthew, Geelong, you know, obviously in an electoral sense, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo area, and so on, are very important to, to you and to your party um, about, uh, and you'd obviously like to win some seats in these areas, but how, how important um, is Geelong to the success, to the success not only of, of, the, of the Liberal Party, but to the success of our state? Because, uh, you know, at, at the moment we have one federal um, Senator, and we've got Bev in the upper house, and the rest is uh, is red. Um, and you know, it, I, I guess where I sit, in, you know, I don't hide away from the fact that I have liberal connections. But the way I see it is to have all red, all blue is not good. Um, so how are you going to? What are you going to do about trying to balance up things? 
look, Geelong does have swing seats. I mean, swing seats at a federal and state level, and they do change. Um, you know, obviously, I'd like to see, <laughs> I'd like to see it all blue, um, but I'm a bit biased. But the point is that Geelong is not a small city anymore. That's why it's got marginal seats, safe seats, and swinging seats. I mean, we forget this. Geelong is now Geelong, the Bellarine, that surf coast, that whole area of Victoria is operating almost as a conurbation is not the right word, a broader, greater community unto its own right. Doesn't rely on Melbourne really like it used to. So you're seeing a city of nearly 300,000 people in that greater area now. Those towns have got their own personality on the Bellarine. The Surf Coast has got its own personality. Geelong is a large metropolitan centre. It's twice the size of a place like Darwin. It's bigger than Hobart. You know, it's a big city by Australian standards. I mean, take out the cities over a million, Apart from that, Geelong's one of the biggest. It's, it's a, we forget that. It's a big metropolitan area nowadays. So that's something I'd say to everyone on this, this uh, call as the Chamber of Commerce, you know, as a city unto its own right, and that's why we at the last election had a view of a state of cities, not a city state, because too much attention is always about Melbourne. Every one of those projects I mentioned before is all in Melbourne. Yet we've got these big centres, particularly in Geelong, that are growing. And I think it's actually positive that you're seeing that whole area, like the Hunter in New South Wales, which is not reliant on Sydney, this part of Victoria is now developing its own strength to rely on itself. And COVID, I think, has actually given the ability, uh, maybe you tell me, the mindset, the, the by necessity that Geelong can't keep relying on Melbourne from, you know, for maybe in your field, health or in other fields, what it might be. Geelong's got to do it by itself. It's a big enough city now, and it's kind of time to get on and acting and thinking and operating like a fairly large city, which is what it is. And with that comes, obviously, politicians have electoral interest. But more the point, it's a good thing that Geelong's becoming a much bigger city. Melbourne can't deal with pressure by itself, population growth, which will come again. Places like Geelong, it's good that Geelong is growing. I think that's very, very positive for our state. Matthew, one of the... Um, the I guess controversial things where we've been waiting for our city deal to to um to start and and you know people it, I guess it's a big picture item and you know we don't want to be known as as just uh, trying to steal all the money from country Victoria but it, the whole thing seems to be languishing and not going anywhere. What what sort of support do you think that you as a government would offer Geelong that we're not getting offered at the moment? I think um, you we, you know. Politicians can talk about funding, which they love, both sides. We like to announce big projects. We like to have all these things that people, are, it's tangible, if you like. But I think the best thing for Geelong in the long term, mentioning what I said before, is an attitude change in government. It's not a regional city. Geelong is a metropolitan area. It's a big city in Australian standards. Having an attitude change, a mindset change to Geelong, actually encouraging larger you know, businesses and corporates in Melbourne to have that Victorian presence outside of Melbourne and obviously in Geelong. I think that's a good thing. I think having an attitude change to Geelong about what Geelong is. You know, I hear this talk when people say, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo, you know, our big cities, Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo, our regional cities. I kind of balk at that because I don't think, I mean, with respect to other centres, you're not a regional centre. A regional centre is, you know, with respect, it is like, you know, Wagga or Ballarat or, 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 or um, Toowoomba. Geelong is bigger than that. It is significant in a corporate sense nowadays, obviously in a health sense, university sense. It has got everything that the makings of a big urban area should have. So we need to think of it that way as an urban centre, as Victoria having two major urban centres, two major CBDs, the CBD of Melbourne and the CBD of Geelong. That's the way we should be thinking about it. So when we're talking about transport links, which I note was promised last time, never been delivered, but my view is should be committed to, we need to think about linking our two major CBDs, and that is Geelong and Melbourne. Good. Now, get back onto the Chamber. So you, you probably know that the, uh, Geelong Chamber is one of the biggest chambers in regional Australia, and we um, have um, over 600 members. We have a reach of 15,000 people. And we had a function a couple of weeks ago where there's 30,000 people watching it online. So what, what do you see as the role of chambers in communities like ours? I think the best thing, um, and I've seen obviously a lot over my time as a minister and previously as opposition leader and now again, I think it's important for communities 
who are advocating for particularly projects or, um, or interest or, or, or a story, if you like, to have a commonality in your point of view. So I used to say this to, I think it was the Committee for Shepherd, and I remember saying it to them, you know, I went up there and one group had one point of view, one group had another point of view, the committee had this point of view, the council had another. Make sure you've got shared interests and the same goals, and particularly in Geelong, where you've got a number of organisations that, uh, that promote Geelong. Make sure you've got a shared purpose, commonality of interests. It's much easier to get politicians at a federal or a state level on side for commitments if you're all singing from the same hymn book rather than, you know, I might please the chamber by giving, by offering this and someone else by offering something else. Have a shared point of view, a shared vision for your city. Um, I think that's very, very important, particularly in a city which is now developing rapidly like Geelong. So I'll put a, a question in here um, from my part of the world. So mental health is obviously a, a, a massive problem at the moment. People would be surprised to know that, um, that Barham Health's um, mental health facilities is the, has the highest rate of occupancy in the whole of Victoria, that uh, Barham Health region has the highest rate of suicide in Victoria, um, and that Barham Health doesn't even have a uh, drug and alcohol detox bed, not a dedicated funded bed. So th there's that side of it where I see that mental health is underfunded, but on the other side of it is that there, there are those of us in the business who are dealing with people in our business, not me as a doctor, but in our business who are just about to lose it. And there are lots and lots of people. Maybe they're going to come out of it, but I still see that there's a lot of doom and gloom. And, you know, and I just ask you, what, what what's your sort of overall think about mental health, both in the hospital system and helping businesses and so on going forward? I think we all know that mental health, <clears throat> mental health is going to be the biggest challenge over the next a uh, few years, the next year's coming, because it's not just about those in business, it's about their kids, um, their friends at school, people, as I said before, who have been inside by themselves for two years, in effect, lockdown. You know, this is going to be a substantial challenge. And importantly, it's not just, as it appears to be for the current government, a focus on inputs, it's about outputs. So it's not just saying we've committed this amount of money. Well, if you're not getting much for it, there's not much use. We need to make sure that people have got mental health support at the time they need it. Two of the announcements we made, or I made very early on when I resumed the leadership, was around mental health for children and actually uh, doubling the number of mental health officers that could be in primary and secondary schools, non-government and government. And I think that is a huge focus at the moment. I mean, as a parent, and I'm sure as others on this Zoom would know, you see it in your own kids and you see it in their friends. You know, my middle son could not deal with any more homeschooling or home learning, whatever you want to call it, that they could not deal with it. He was out. So, um, you know, he's having a trouble getting back into the school routine. And if it's just him, imagine how many others, you know, are similar. And I know that from some of his teachers saying that as well. So mental health support is going to be the greatest, one of the, one of the greatest challenges we'll have coming out of COVID. And it's not just about money. Governments just think, oh, I'll throw money at it, and then that's the answer. That's a great line. Well, actually, no, this is about people's genuine mental health. And it needs a lot more attention than that. If we need to train more people, then put in place the facilities to train more. If we can bring some on, as we propose, by changing definitions in legislation, then do that. Take advice from everyone. Don't just think because you didn't think of it, it's not a good idea. My view is that we, we need to focus on that very, very quickly from a national and state level national and state level. Uh, Matthew, your style of leadership, um, you know, it, it might be said that in the past you're a bit of a bruiser, uh, not, not actually in the, in the Tim Smith mould, but um, halfway. Um, and and uh, so, you know, you're a lot, you're what, three, three years older since you remember, uh, since you were the leader the last time. Do you think you're, you've changed? Do you think you've mellowed? Do you think you've matured or is, is, do you think that you'll bring a different style of leadership going into the next election? Bev, would you say that I've always been sweet tempered and tolerant? <laughs> Look, a, a mouse at heart, really. <laughs> um, John, I never thought of myself as a bruiser, but I keep reading that apparently I was a political brawler. I thought, oh, 
<laughs> I didn't think I was. Maybe I came across that way. Maybe I came across that way. wasn't intentional. Look, uh, I think, if anything, um, you know, I've done it before. Like my staff come to me and say, oh, we've got to do this and this and this. And I say to them, listen, I've done this job for four and a half years. I, I know exactly what to do, so don't, don't, don't get too worked up about it. There's much worse days than today, for instance, you know. Um, but I think it's just experience. It's like anything in life. If, if you've done it for a period of time, um, when you do it for a second time, it's like putting an old glove on. You're like, well, yeah, I know what I did wrong and I know what seemed to work at the time. Um, and everyone makes mistakes in life. I'm certainly not immune from that. We all know that. Um, but you, it's just experience. It can't, can't take anything away from the experience. It's just the best tool, the best learning device is experience. And Matthew, I notice when you do um, interviews, you've, on that blue background, you've got a slogan there. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? How reopen, about? recover and rebuild. We're going to drop the reopen because we've all reopened. So yeah. we have to go back and change it to recover and rebuild because that's what we want to do next. It's about recovery. So let's talk about recovery, which is around mental health, which is around getting kids back to school, which is around keeping us back at work, which is making sure public servants are back in the office so that our major CBDs like Melbourne and Geelong can get everyone back to full strength so that cafes can open so that we get life into cities again, because what makes cities tick is people. It's not just the weather or the location, it's, it's people. So we've got, to, we've got to recover and then we've got to rebuild. And we say, let's rebuild our economy. Let's encourage small business to get them, you know, operating, profitable, give them the certainty they want that there's no more lockdowns coming, get everyone vaccinated so we can do that properly and that uh, people can operate sensibly and let's get on with life. So it's about recovering from where we are and rebuilding our economy and looking to the future so that we've got a plan going forward. And from my point of view, this is, this is the priority. It's not about... Um, terrifying the population that, you know, we're going to get a third strain or we're going to get this, or we're going to get that. Look, we are all very well aware of what we might all face. I think everyone who's, who's got half a sane mind knows that the best way forward for any of us is just to get vaccinated and then we're all protected. That's what you can do as an individual. Can't do much more than that. Wash your hands when you see it, get vaccinated, and that's the sensible way to go forward. But we've really got to get back to living our life normally because otherwise, um, you know, you can live, you can exist but not live. And I think we need to recover and rebuild. And that's that the next part is where the state goes in terms of rebuilding. And that's what we're talking about, certainly next year in, in, in particular. Matthew, 45,000 people have left Victoria um, to go and live interstate. And, you know, that's the um, population of Wodonga, I think, yeah, uh, roughly. It is. It is. Yeah. What, what would you do and, and how, how would the Liberal government stop that, um, that exodus of people? It's a really good question because that is a really big problem and it's not just 45,000 out of Victoria, it's really about 55,000 out of Melbourne and uh, with, a, with another you know, 10, 15 going to regional and Geelong. Now that's fine for Geelong and regional Victoria because people are moving out. That, that's one part's fine, but you can't have 70% of your, uh, of your population in one city falling to bits. That, that's, not a, that's not a strategy for uh, social or economic success into the future. What the state needs is certainty and confidence. That's very, very important. Confidence that we're going somewhere, that we're not fighting. Confidence that we're talking about the future, not the past. And that's one of my criticisms about this current debate around the pandemic bill is that we're still talking about COVID. We're still talking about being in a state of emergency or a state of disaster. We should be talking about moving on for the sake of everyone's mental health, for the sake of our economy, for the sake of getting our minds focused on issues outside of COVID. I think we must, and that's the first step, rebuilding. Um, because you can't, you can't give certainty for people wanting to invest in Victoria create jobs in Victoria, give careers to kids in Victoria if they think we're in a permanent state of siege. New South Wales is lowering taxes at the moment. Queensland's lowering taxes. Victoria's putting them up. Well, why would you invest in Victoria? I mean, I don't know if the current strategy at the moment is to be like, you know, one per on so that, you know, everyone in the community has somehow got a link back to government. That's not a winning, that's not a winning formula for success. New South Wales and Queensland, one's Liberal, one's Labor, but they're both doing the same thing. They're encouraging business, predominantly out of Victoria, up there. Now, a capital flight out of our state, people might say, what's that mean? What's that mean is jobs. 
It means jobs, it means future, it means employment, it means certainty. It's everything our state is founded on. If you don't have that kind of certainty, it's very difficult to get it back. And I fear that it's not just losing, we have lost it, lost it by a prolonged, seemingly prolonged fights uh, in this state at the, at the level of governance. So Matthew, I'm gonna read a couple of questions which have come through the chat. So Chris Lane um, has, has asked, if elected, what is the willingness of the Victorian Liberal Party to work with the federal government and other states towards national standards for areas such as emergency powers? It's a really good question because I think one of the glaring holes out of COVID is the operation of federation. Um, I thought the national cabinet idea was a really good one. You know, the concept of uh, all the state premiers, irrespective of their political party, right? Chief ministers, the state premiers and the prime minister sitting around a room saying, all right, well, how are we going to deal with this? The concept was really good. All the state premiers was it was really, I thought it was very encouraging to see them all there. The majority of them are actually not of my side of politics. That's irrespective. Um, and my view was we could have used the national cabinet process beyond what we've currently been using it for. And so the, the topic just mentioned could be one, again, used by, pardon me, the national cabinet process to get some uniformity across state borders. Um, it appears the national cabinet process is either breaking down or broken down. And I don't think that's a good thing for our country. I think we need to have a debate about federation and the way our country is operating and structured, because it's not good that we have these state premiers operating like sheriffs, uh, you know, with spurs and gun holsters saying, well, this town's mine and you can clear off. None of this is good for our country. Yeah, good. Thank you. And now one from Scott Laurie. So, hi, Matthew. Federal election is around the corner. Geelong is traditionally a strong Labor held seat. What opportunities can the Liberal, Federal and State offer Geelong Barwon to change the thinking of this community? Well, um, the seat of Karayo technically has, has traditionally been a, a strong Labor seat, but the seat of Karangamite has traditionally been long held by the Liberal Party. So there's been, uh, and Bev would know this because uh, her husband represented it for about 20 odd, 30 odd years in the parliament. So, you know, we've, we've had a bit of either and Karangamite's demographics have changed a bit. It's more, well, it's obviously a marginal seat now. Um, the point being that, Obviously, with a city now the size of Geelong, there gives a lot of electoral interest. And that's politics. It does give interest. And I think that's why I say you should get your priorities as the chamber and through other groups um, about what, what you want from state and federal governments from both sides of politics and be open and upfront and campaign for them and say these are the priorities of our city. Um, through the council, I know, which has done a lot of work, good work in particular, um, to say these are our priorities as a city, whether it's healthcare, you know, in, in education, in um, uh, environmental issues, whatever it might be. But, but I think that's important because it gives a narrative to the city about where you're going. And that's very important. So Matthew, um, I, yeah, I, one of the things that um, happened out of the, one of the lockdowns is that we, the, the Geelong Chamber, which is, you know, is fairly robust, we saw that there are lots of other chambers which were floundering and you know they actually required some state government support and you know they, they're more than chambers they're community groups they bring people together and they have a function as well as helping people's businesses but they actually help them as individuals do you think that um, going forward that you know we can look at uh, the the liberal um party or the liberal government um supporting the chambers in in a similar way to what the labor party is doing now Yes, but, you know, we don't want everything just to be simply taxpayer funded for the sake of it. We want, you know, we want to encourage organisations to get on their own two feet and to prosper and to thrive. I think, you know, our view of, uh, Bev and my view of government has always been about government being an enabler, but not the, um, the default to rely on. You know, we want to encourage, whether it's groups or private enterprise and others to succeed, we want to enable them to do well. And that's, that's our philosophy. Our philosophy is not to have everyone on the, the government's teeth because after a while that dries up and then the organisations collapse. And we've seen, I remember some, uh, you know, small business groups that were prominent in the 90s that then relied on government support to exist. And as soon as the government support dried up, they no longer exist anymore. Um, so I don't think that's healthy. I think what's healthy is support here and there. It might be sponsorship for conferences. You know, I, I worked for an industry group, the Farmers Federation, before I, I came into politics. And I saw this myself. If you become too reliant on government alone, well, you may as well become part of government. You're just an arm of government. You don't want to do that. You want to advocate 
And so we like to make sure that groups survive and have the ability to survive. And, and you know, whether it's conferences and others to sponsor to survive, but we want them to survive and we'll do what we can to make them survive through their own principles. And it's very, very important. So just changing um, tack now. So um, this is from Empower World. Um, there's a lot of climate anxiety taking place, particularly for the younger generations. And, and I think a lot of older generations as well. Um, what are your thoughts about this? Um, you know, where, where does that fit into state politics, I guess? Well, I think the Prime Minister, when he's in Melbourne um, some weeks ago, had some very good, uh, very good, uh, not just a policy initiative on the Climate Fund that he launched, but also a commentary about where our country's going on this debate. Because in the past, the debate about climate change has all been, always been about, well, who do we tax to stop it? And who do we regulate to deal with it? When in fact, the debate should be about us. I mean, if we want a problem fixed, particularly in this country, the best people to solve a problem is private enterprise, because suddenly it becomes in their interest to do that. But we get the problem solved very quickly. So therefore, that's the part of the Prime Minister's announcement on, um, on that uh, the climate fund, and that is to enable industry to be a part, a very strong part of the solution. We're now seeing this. You'll see this particularly in Europe and America around energy, uh, around household products, for instance, which are, 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 are climate neutral, CO2 neutral, for instance. So um, the carbon neutral, sorry. So what you're seeing is when you start to enable the private sector to be a, a key part of the solution, the solution will come very quickly. Government will actually, in my view, in the next 10 years become irrelevant in the climate change debate, irrelevant. Heineken beer is already now sourcing all their products from carbon neutral suppliers. Um, it might cost you five cents more in a beer, but they're getting their outcome. No one minds, they're still buying their carbon neutral beer. But the point is the private sector is solving it much quicker, more efficiently than if, for example, uh, Holland or Belgium, wherever it's made, is put on this great big whopping carbon tax to tax Heineken out of existence. So private sector will solve it much quicker. That's what we've got to do in Australia. Move the debate from being around conflict and government to how the private sector and kids coming through uni, and I've seen plenty of them with ideas like solar paint on the side of skyscrapers to enable the skyscraper to become uh, almost like a power generation source, self-sustainable unto itself. I mean, there's so many ideas but we've got to get them off the ground. And that's how the private sector will start to solve this problem before our very eyes much quicker than I think governments would if we tried to regulate tax and berate in order to solve this problem. Just one last question. Um, it's on, on the labour shortage that's, um, you know, it's, I'll predict it's going to be a crisis actually. And um, most of us in business uh, find it very difficult to get employees. Um, and now employees are probably not quite uh, what's the word? So that they're able to go from place to place. There's plenty, you know. There, if you if you read the paper, um, and I'm not sure how accurate it is, dishwasher's getting hundred thousand dollars a year. So we've got all that um, ahead. But you know, is it is it purely just because we don't have enough students, and um, or is it is there more to it? There's a big reason. The, the lack of students is a big reason. I mean, we've been saying this for some time to. Um, to build a quarantine facility some months ago, get it open and get overseas students, double vaxxed overseas students through Australia after quarantining, double vaxxed, quarantine, come back into Australian society and get them back here. Hey, universities need them. And people say, oh, well, universities shouldn't have built a business model like that. Well, actually they had no reason not to because we all thought that would be the case and it would remain the case. And there's nothing wrong with having foreign students here. It's a good market and we, we like, uh, frankly, they're very good for our, not just our economy, they're good social. They're good for our future to have a lot of foreign students coming to our country. We want them back. But a lot of them have got a great work ethic. So when they're studying over here, they also work, whether it's in shops, whether it's in restaurants, whatever. And so that has been a big part of the problem. Now, we, when governments borrow so much money that they throw that back and outprice, hypothetically, um, labourers on a, on a, on a, a level crossing removal in Melbourne getting 40% more than if they worked for a home builder building you know, new homes in the burbs, that's fine, but all of that has an inflationary impact. And I, we can now start to see that occurring. We haven't had reasonable levels of inflation in this country for some years, decades even. I think we are on the cusp of seeing that. The RBA is warning about that um, because if we, you know, we are short on labour, 
if we don't deal with those labour shortages from overseas. I saw somewhere the other day, there's something like a quarter of a million jobs that can't be filled. It's not that they can't be filled because there's not people who need work. They can't be filled because we don't have the skills to fill them. Um, it's also, as I said before, about all these infrastructure projects, we don't have a lot of the skills to make them happen. We need to get those people in Australia. There are overseas markets who will supply that labour in or the specialised labour that we need or uh, students to fill some of those gaps, but we need them here. And, and, if, and if our annual default is just simply shut the state borders to each other, shut the international borders, if that shutting borders is our based response to everything relating to this pandemic, then, you know, there's going to be a long hangover. And I suspect there will be as a result. And 45,000 people going to another state doesn't help as well. That's um, well, spot on, spot on. So, look, thank you. Um, I'll, I'd just like to invite um, Bev MacArthur to give a vote of thanks and, uh, to, and then I'll come back and conclude the event and thank Matthew again. Thank so, you. Bev? Well, thank you, John, and thank you, Matthew, for being with the Geelong Chamber today. Uh, I think you've been very frank and open and given lots of insights into where you stand. And I know that Matthew uh, and I both care about the people of Victoria, and I particularly care about the people of Western Victoria. Um, and uh, we have to deliver hope and opportunity. And as Matthew said, certainty and confidence, that's what's critical. Uh, yeah, as you can see, Matthew's a fantastic family man. He, he's done a great job at trying to do the homeschooling or whatever we call it, home learning. Uh, and it's not easy. And he, so he can relate to all those families who have been absolutely struggling through this ridiculous lockdown. Melbourne's the most locked down city in the world. You can't believe it. We've had curfews. You'd think we were locking up people in Barwon prison because they were, you know, terrible criminals. But we've locked, locked up innocent Victorians. It's all been a hopeless uh, situation. So I know that Matthew's open to new ideas. He's open to a better way of doing government. Uh, and he cares about what's outside the tram tracks uh, of, of Melbourne. And you've, you've seen and heard that he understands what Geelong needs to become and, and how that's going to help the rest of uh, my area of Western Victoria. Um, and also, just a little ad here, if, if you'd like to chat to Matthew in person, I'll give you a golden opportunity on the 6th of December out in the, the wonderful Ballerine electorate. And I'll, uh, I'll let John know all the details. You can contact John or I, you just hand over your membership list and I'll send everybody an invitation. <laughs> uh, and, and that'll be fantastic. So Matthew and I, you know, we wouldn't be in politics if we weren't eternal optimists. And, and that's what you get from Matthew. And we see that there are no problems. There are only opportunities in this world. And that's what we have to focus on. We're in the glass half full category, not the glass half empty rubbish. Uh, and so you'll get from Matthew and the coalition moving forward a vision for this whole area that I think will be new and different and better and uh, we want to work with all of you. We know that business is the enabler to a better way of life for this yep. region. So thank you, Matthew, very much uh, for joining the Chamber today. And I know you'll look forward to uh, joining them again in person. Uh, in the meantime, I'll make sure the Chamber know every, every time you're going to be in this area <laughs> and they can personally buttonhole you. Uh, along with your other shadow ministers. Thank you, John, and thank you, the Chamber. Thanks, Bev. All right, so I'll just wind it up now. Um, look, I'd just like to thank, uh, thank you, Matthew. Thanks for, your, yeah, yeah, for your time um, at a busy time, and you know, we really we're grateful, and we look forward to perhaps having you back next year, maybe face to face. Um, also, thank you to Bev. Um, for doing that wind up there. I actually thought um, Bev, that we were gonna get another guest speaker and that you were you were the, the, the backup role, you're doing the backup role, but so thank you, Bev. Um, we enjoy your passion. So I'd just like to um, thank Ben, Rachel um, and Zach for putting this on today. Also just to quickly um, promote a couple of things. So tonight's the AGM uh, where we've got 18 people standing for three positions. So look, good luck to the three people who who win and um, we look forward to not only working with those three people, but the other 15 going forward. Um, we've got a, a community 
um, functions, a function at Avalon Airport on the 15th of December. Um, so it's face-to-face -face, uh, community networking. You're able to bring guests, but you have to pay for them. Members, of course, will be for free and uh, res registrations will be essential. So hopefully we can see you there. Um, for anyone who prefers online chats, um, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, there's a member mingle. And look, thanks everyone for joining us today. Thanks for taking an hour and a half out of your day. And uh, I, I enjoyed talking to Matthew. What I got out of it is he's a pretty normal guy, actually. Um, so yeah, thanks Matthew and Bev and um, see, you, see you around everyone. Bye. Thanks again. Thanks again.